it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, uh, the Right Honourable Simon Upton, our Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. Now, Mr Upton needs very little introduction, I'm sure, but I, I, I've been asked to do it, so I'm going to do it, seeing as he's paying my fee. Uh, Mr Upton is a Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand and a Rhodes Scholar. He was sworn in as a member of the Privy Council in 1999. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's very relevant. A Member of Parliament between 1981 and 2000, Mr Upton held a variety of ministerial portfolios including the Environment, Research, Biosecurity, Health and State Services between 1990 and 1999. After leaving Parliament, Mr Upton moved to Paris to chair the Roundtable on Sustainable Development at the OECD. In 2005, he returned to New Zealand to pursue a number of private sector roles while continuing in the, to chair the Roundtable. In April 2010, he returned to the OECD full-time as Environment Director, a post he held for seven years until returning to take up his current role as the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. Welcome, Commissioner. You'll give me that time as part of my speech, oh, won't you? Absolutely. <laughs> Tēnā koutou katoa, Morena, I'm going to read you 2,765 words to make sure that I communicate precisely. Uh, and we're all hoping that this works. I'd like to use the opportunity to underline the scale of the challenge livestock farming faces if we're to tackle its contribution to climate change seriously. New Zealand agriculture exists because of mass deforestation. Forest clearance released about 18 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's roughly 10 times the amount of CO2 from burning fossil fuels we've ever released. And because, of course, it hangs around, the consequences of that deforestation are still warming the planet today. Sometime in the middle of the 20th century, slowing rates of deforestation and increased rates of new forest planting meant that our forests switched from being a net source to a net sink of carbon dioxide. Since then, uh, forest planting, a lot of it Pinus radiata, has sequestered roughly 1.4 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. So as a result, this source of warming is now very gradually declining. By comparison, the warming contributions from fossil carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and livestock from methane emissions have been much smaller excluding the legacy warming effect of the historic deforestation, that's the big green bit, methane from livestock currently accounts for around 55% of New Zealand's contribution to warming, nitrous oxide accounts for 14%, and fossil carbon dioxide accounts for the remaining 31%. These numbers, by the way, are based on what you get if you put New Zealand's emissions in tonnes of each gas into a climate model called Magic Sea. They're not based on the much maligned GWP 100 or any other type of emissions metric. Let's take a closer look at methane emissions from livestock. They rose steeply during the 1950s and 60s on the back of increases in sheep and beef cattle numbers. Since the early 1990s, methane emissions from dairy cattle have risen while emissions from sheep have declined. So the overall result is that total livestock methane emissions have been roughly stable over the last two decades. However, the warming caused by these emissions is still increasing. This is due to the inertia in the transfer of heat between different parts of the Earth system, as well as climate carbon cycle feedbacks, which continue to have a small warming effect even after the methane has itself left the atmosphere. Now, as you know, Parliament's legislated targets to reduce biogenic methane emissions by 10% by 2030 and 24 to 47% by 2050 relative to the 2017 level, and to reduce all other gases to net zero by 2050. So what do these targets mean in terms of warming? The solid red area shows the warming from carbon dioxide that's more or less locked in from emissions to date. The hatched red area shows the warming from future emissions that are yet to occur. The warming from carbon dioxide will continue to rise until emissions reach zero, at which point the warming will plateau. Now, the Climate Change Response Act doesn't have a target for gross carbon dioxide emissions, so for the purposes of this slide, we're assuming that they track the Climate Change Commission's demonstration pathway with further reductions beyond 2050. 
Here's the equivalent warming path for nitrous oxide. By contrast, most of the warming from methane emissions to date will be gone within a few decades because methane doesn't hang around. This means that we have the option to significantly turn down the warming from methane within our lifetimes by reducing methane emissions, if we choose to. Now, it's important to focus on warming. Everything I've shown you has been about warming because that's what we're trying to mitigate. Reducing methane emissions, 12% by 2050, generates a warming track like this. Meeting the low end of the legislated target of 24% by 2050 looks like this. It's similar to a pathway designed to achieve no additional warming above the current level. And reaching the upper end of the target, 47%, looks like that. Now, I'm aware that there are those who argue that all we need to do is show that we're not causing any more warming than we already are. That reducing emissions just enough to get a nice flat line will do the trick. It won't. Under the Paris Agreement, New Zealand has an international obligation to do as much as it can to keep the 1.5 degree global goal within reach. It is not a credible negotiating position to say that our largest contribution to warming is off limits when we have the option to reduce it. As a little country, we need to argue hard for international action, and we have no credibility if we seek a leave pass for our largest contributor. Neither should we be tempted by the argument that since we're a little country, it doesn't make sense for us to develop the technologies needed to solve the world's problems, and that we should instead be a fast follower. While that might be true of concrete or steel, but when it comes to agricultural emissions, who are we waiting to follow? We have more skin in this game than others. We have serious research capacity. We have long congratulated ourselves on our productivity and resourcefulness. The logic all leads to the conclusion that we have to tackle this problem head on. And as the minister said, <laughs> there's pure self-interest in this, we have an interest in continuing to sell products to high-income markets where consumers are taking an increasing interest in the emissions footprint of their food and drink. For all these reasons, I agree with the Climate Change Commission and the government that having targets to reduce warming from methane to below the current level is justified. How far below the current level is a matter for the government to decide based on advice from the Climate Change Commission. I'd simply observe that the current 24 to 47% reduction target is so wide a range that the scale of transformation expected from the primary sector is very unclear. And if the 2050 methane target is updated, I would encourage the government to choose a narrower target range. Now, to meet any target, we need to build a solid consensus about how best we can make progress. Reductions in emissions from livestock can be achieved in one of two ways. You can reduce livestock numbers through lower stocking rates per hectare and land use, and you can reduce emissions per animal through changes in management practices and the uptake of new on-farm technologies as they become available. Now, even in the absence of a price on biological emissions, we are seeing land use change driven by an insatiable demand for carbon offsets as the New Zealand ETS price rises. As many of you know, I have expressed grave doubts about our reliance on forestry offsets as a way of meeting emissions targets for fossil CO2. We should wean ourselves off this option. On the other hand, I have suggested that using whatever forestry stock we generate to offset the warming caused by our agricultural emissions might be more justifiable. Now, the number of trees needed to offset the warming from a given herd of animals is set out in a paper I commissioned with Professor Dave Frame and Dr. Nathaniel Melia. The number is not small, and it could only be a part of the solution. I'll come back to that point, but for now, let me just focus on the second approach, reducing emissions per animal. In the dairy sector, 
Changing management practices can deliver, I'm told, moderate reductions in emissions, maybe of the order of 10%. Fewer options are currently available for changing management practices on sheep and beef farms. Whatever the case, and there are people in this audience much better placed to judge the fine detail than I am, the existing possibilities will not get us to a 24% reduction in methane emissions by 2050, let alone 47%. Fortunately, promising new mitigation technologies are in the pipeline. I'm not going to list them to this gathering. In fact, I'm looking forward to hearing more about them later today. But it's clear that without accelerated progress on some of these technical fixes, the only way we will meet our 2050 methane target will be through very large reductions in stocking rates. So, the work being undertaken by our science and research organisations on reducing agricultural emissions is therefore a critical component of New Zealand's climate change policy. We must get this right. Now, in 2003, so that's when this all starts, the government began to invest money in reducing agricultural emissions through the PGGRC, and the consortium invested around $5 million per annum between 2003 and 2021, uh, with funding from MB being matched by industry. Then, in 2009, there we are. The New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre was established, and it received around $5 million per year from MPI over the following decade. Then there was the Global Research Alliance, also established in 2009, which I claim an element of parentage. It received around $65 million over the following decade. And finally, MPI's Sustainable Land Management and Climate Change Program, which you can see with binoculars there, invested around $2.5 million per year between 2007 and 2019. So all told, in the decade between 2009 and 2018, the government spent roughly $20 million per year on research into the emissions of a sector that in 2019 alone generated $24 billion in export earnings. Scarcely a level of investment commensurate with the value at risk and the urgency of finding a way forward. And saying that, I'm levelling no criticisms at those who battled away with the resources they had. The fact that they battled away means they're there to be used today. Budget 2022 saw a significant step change. How's that? The government announced an additional $340 million over four years to accelerate the development of mitigation technologies in the ag sector, with industry committing to spend at least $35 million per year by 2025. It's worth noting that since this initiative is funded from the Climate Emergency Response Fund, it is effectively being paid for by the fossil emitting sector of society. I'd like to congratulate the Minister and those who managed to successfully steer this initiative through the gauntlet of the annual budget process. It is long overdue. What a pity that we didn't take the challenge more seriously two decades ago when the PGGRC was set up. Two decades on, we are awaiting a science and Matoronga plan from Bursa, the Biological Emissions Reduction Science Accelerator. That in itself has been two years in the making, which worries me a little. The scale of the additional funding creates overnight a new risk. Can the system absorb the resources? And can we sustain that effort long enough to generate results? Research can't be turned on and off overnight. So the government, sorry, the governance arrangements for all this money really matter. As I understand it, we're going to have a center for climate action on agricultural emissions, a public-private partnership or joint venture, as well as the existing New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center with its focus on more fundamental public good research. International collaboration will be important too. The Global Research Alliance has played an important role since 2009. 
An international team of researchers led by Tim Searchinger at Princeton, who is a really good guy, by the way, has identified several specific areas in which international collaboration could usefully be expanded, such as setting up a coordinated multi-year evaluation of promising methane inhibitors in 20 to 30 countries. However, how we arrange things really matters. We must avoid this is my plea, a convoluted labyrinth of governance arrangements crippled by risk aversion and the temptation to second guess those who are most familiar with the field. Now, during his visit to New Zealand last year, Professor Frank Convery from University College Dublin suggested to me that valuable lessons could be learned from the UK's highly successful program to develop COVID-19 vaccines. In 2020, the UK government appointed a venture capitalist uh, called Kate Bingham to head the UK's new COVID-19 vaccine task force. Bingham put together a steering group of nine people, mainly, not entirely, from the private sector. And she later said that one of the factors behind the success of the program was that they resisted the temptation to penny pinch. She also suggested that government ministries are often far too risk averse and can learn from a venture capitalist mindset where a proportion of failure is acceptable. Of course, they were drawing on deep, deep, deep public investment, but getting it out there, getting it to the market required a different mindset. Now, the government's commitment to help uh, fund, uh, sorry, I, I just missed one of the 2,765 word paragraphs. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, developing a COVID-19 vaccine is not the same as developing a methane vaccine, but I agree with Professor Convery that the UK experience is worth reflecting on as the New Zealand government decides how it's going to empower its new centre and galvanise sustained focus on its central mission, which is to see management changes and on-farm mitigation technologies deployed at scale within a reasonable time. Now, the government's commitment to help fund solutions represents, and the minister's right, a significant subsidy. And it's one that I think is justified. Now, Assuming that those research investments succeed in opening up new mitigation opportunities, the next task is to have them adopted. This brings us to the thorny issue of carrots and sticks. The government's pricing mechanism proposes both emissions levies and incentive payments. You heard Rod Carr yesterday describe it less kindly as a tax-like mechanism to fund the bureaucratic overhead to give some of it back as good behaviour grants. Putting a price on agricultural emissions should be designed to incentivise the uptake of less emissions-intensive management practices. That's how environmental taxes are supposed to work, and they do work. In setting the level of any levy, regard has to be had for the availability of mitigation options. There's little point in using economic tools to incentivise behaviour change if there are no ways to change behaviour. But there are some even now. I mentioned 10%, the order of 10% being available. Now, if new mitigation options arise, levies should rise to expedite their uptake. You've got to get this stuff to happen. And if you don't like levies, then the alternative is regulation, the mandated uptake of technologies and management practices. I know which I would prefer. There is, of course, also the option of land use change. Now, in some cases, this will be the best thing for the land and the climate. It may also be a way to meet our targets at lower cost. Let's assume that within a decade we have a suite of tools we can deploy that can get us somewhere in the 24 to 47% range for livestock methane. We could then add to whatever progress we have made by tree planting. That was the idea I wanted to test in the note I mentioned earlier. Uh, and here's the, here's the, 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 the simple version. Um, uh, that's the one. To my mind, it would be preferable for the pastoral sector to be planting trees where that makes sense, rather than witnessing wholesale land use change driven by fossil fuel emitters who have no long-term stake in that land. 
But, and I must emphasize this, tree planting could only ever be a part of the solution because offsetting all of the warming from livestock would require an impossibly large area of forest. So it's at the margin and it's a thing we could do in addition to what this research effort is all about. I'd like to end with an observation on the coherence of different areas of government policy. Agriculture's exemption from emissions pricing since 2008 is not the only example of the government in effect subsidizing activities that emit greenhouse gases. The government's overly generous free allocation regime for emissions intensive trade exposed industries in the New Zealand ETS provides another example. And I welcome news that the government is finally introducing changes to pare back those overly generous allocations. Less welcome was the government's decision in March uh, last year to cut the fuel excise duty by 25 cents per litre. The excise duty was initially triggered when average petrol prices rose to above $3 a litre. But by the time it was extended for a third time in December 2022, average petrol prices outside of Auckland had already fallen to under $2.40 per litre. The cut in the excise will have cost around $1.4 billion by the end of March this year. Not only is this a poor, untargeted policy that flies in the face of New Zealand's stated climate ambitions, it's one for which we'll have nothing to show when it's over. Having something to show for the money that is spent has to be part of the bottom line. And getting on top of our climate change response will be difficult and expensive enough without poorly targeted expenditure. I'm right behind transitions being just, but we can't compensate everybody. Whether it's low-income households or farming enterprises that face a challenge, we need to spend our scarce resources wisely. I think the government's commitment to working with the private sector and Māori to unlock some practical on-farm answers is a wise use of resources. Now it needs to be sustained long enough to know if there are additional solutions out there. And it, we won't know at the end of four years, so we've got to keep this effort up. And we need to quantify the benefits in terms of reduced warming, because that's what we're trying to achieve. I'm planning to monitor all that very closely. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, look, while I look through these questions, the app is working well again. I'll, I'll start off with the same question asked to uh, Minister O'Connor. What, you, what, in your opinion, what will New Zealand land use look like in 2050? I've got no idea, but it won't look like what it looks like today. For two reasons. We've always had dynamic land use change, markets change, land use changes. So straight away, you can say it'll be different. Secondly, it'll be different because of climate change. And I'm not just thinking of the, the, the awful events that we've seen uh, up in Tairawhiti. Uh, everything is going to change. Uh, just what a season looks like, how long it lasts, where the peaks are, it's all going to change. Uh, so that, that's, that is a really important message in this. Whatever we do, we have to maintain flexibility because we've always been pretty flexible, but, but we have to maintain flexibility of land use change because we don't know what's going to happen where. Thank you. Um, a, comment, a comment followed by a question. So the comment was disheartening. Uh, your, your graph shows uh, very little change in total methane emissions since the 1990s. How does a 47% reduction in emissions not result in closer to a 47% reduction in the temperature response over, uh, over uh, out to 2200. Well, like 2200. Yeah, well, that's what it well, says. Well, no, so it say it will. It, this cuts off at 2050, uh, and 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 that will work through. That will work through. So it's it's not quite as modest as it looks, uh, but it's still it's still <laughs> providing very very significant warming. If you want to ask a more technical question. I have Greg Briner in the audience, who's now hiding desperately. Um, <laughs> but uh, he can give you some chapter verse. And of course, if we've got Dave Frame and uh, here, um, is Dave here? 
he can tell you why these numbers come out as they do, but this is a, this is a, a function of a model, so I, and I can't, you can't interrogate me on the model. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Um, one, one final question. Um, how do we shift the conversation on spending? So much attention is focused on levels of financial debt, but what about future generations' right to resilient infrastructure and a livable planet? I, I saved the easy one for last. Well, no, no, I, it's, I'm, well, I'm not sure that the conversation is all about spending. I mean, I, I was actually interpreting that a different way. I think we have a bad habit in this country, and I've been part of it myself as a minister, a bad habit of saying um, we've spent some money and, and we've done something. I, I, I think we, the, the, and, and I've done it here this morning, I've supported this. I think we do need to spend this money. I think it's really, really important, but there is just a view that you allocate money and you've done something. Uh, it is actually what you are trying to head off, which is much, much, much more important. And, and yes, I think what the questioner was asking is there are economic costs uh, to change, uh, but it's all to do with our short termism as a species, isn't it? It's how you get through the next six and 12 months, or maybe the next six weeks, that is at the front of your mind and where things are going to be in uh, six years or 60 years is, does not press in the same way. It presses through children and grandchildren. It presses through some of those channels. Uh, the older you get, the more you start to think, God, I wish I had taken a longer term view. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think that's a, that's a commentary on our lack of adaptation as a species to confront change at the scale. Uh, we have not experienced what we are now starting to see hook in with climate change. We've got no easy point of reference for that. So we're all finding it very difficult. Most important thing is not to go around blaming people. Uh, it's helping people to understand why it's worth taking uh, long-term action. If people understand stuff, and this is all terribly interesting, by the way. I mean, uh, rather than going banging people over the head about doom, just explaining the process. I mean, there's, a, there's a huge education job still to do about this. It's actually very interesting. Once you've got even half an understanding of it, doing something about it becomes easier, in my view. C Commissioner, I've just refreshed the app, and a question has come up that has got a lot of votes. So if, if you've got a sure, few minutes, I'd sure, love, sure, love sure. to hear your thoughts on this one. What are your thoughts about the use of economics in these challenges? So Bjorn Lomberg and the Copenhagen Consensus uh, uh, recommend where should we spend our money for best results? What are your thoughts on taking a, a cold econometric approach to this? Well, we have to take an economic approach because ultimately we need to mobilise resources to do stuff and there aren't infinite resources. So, sorry, you're never going to get away from, from economics uh, in all of this. Um, I think we need to be honest about the limitations of the economic tools we apply. Um, we, and we also need to be much more transparent about the tools that we apply. I wrote a, a, quite a, a lengthy report um, uh, a year or so back on the way we do well-being budgets. Uh, and the truth is, we, you know, we say all this stuff about well-being and it's the long term and all the rest of it, but we haven't got the tools to actually measure what we mean when we say that. Uh, just the, 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 the issue of what discount rate you use will have a dramatic effect uh, in terms of whether something stacks up or doesn't stack up. Um, so I think that e economics, um, and I'll, I'll flatter them all by saying, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a science, it's a young science, but as a science, economics <coughs> has a lot of work to do uh, to develop the tools needed to take the long term into account and to take uncertainty into account. But I wouldn't dump on uh, economics. And, and, and the, the simple idea that there's an easy cost-benefit tool that you can run over everything uh, is nonsense. You're dealing with profound uncertainty over very long time frames. Uh, there is a point where you have to say, the tools can't help us very much. What's a prudent thing to do given the risks we face and our appetite for risk? And at the end of the day, that is very much um, a social conversation. Um, I'd have said here, coming back to all of this stuff, I don't detect any political movement in New Zealand of any significance that's saying, right, let's use the first of your two strategies, Mr Upton, let's just uh, destock. Let's remove the animals. Because people just cannot imagine the economic and social uh, dislocation that's involved in that. Okay, if that's the case, 
then you have to take a view which says, how do we find a way through that? And that's where economics can help you make hopefully some good decisions about where you deploy your money, what you don't encourage to go on happening and what you do encourage. I mentioned environmental taxes. I'm a supporter of them. If you know that a particular activity generates a particular uh, bad, then putting a price on it tends to steer people away from it. Just exhorting them to won't. Uh, I could go on. I think you've probably heard enough. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you.